Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This bill, though short in title and length, is long on impact. The proposed changes to the Gene Technology Act are first, licence variations, removing a restriction on licence variations to broaden the circumstances in which stakeholders can vary licences rather than apply for new licences. Low risk work, updating the considerations required for de declaring a GMO dealing to be notifiable low risk dealing to enable more low risk dealings with GMOs to be downgraded to the notifiable category instead of requiring licences. Reporting, discontinuing quarterly reporting to the Minister on activities under the Gene Technology Act. Inadvertent dealings, elaborating on activities allowed under an, in, under an inadvertent dealings licence to ensure reasonable activities are explicitly authorised. Public consultation, updating newspaper advertising requirements for notifying the public of consultations on licence application assessments. GMO record, removing the requirement to include genetically modified or GM products authorised by other agencies on the record of GMO and GM product dealings, the GMO record, and clarifying wording. <coughs> this bill continues the work of Red Tape Reduction Mission as epitomised in the previous two red tape appeal day, uh, repeal days. Moreover, it is consistent. Consistent with the economic plan as articulated in our plan, the document we put before the people at the last federal election in 2013. The plan is elegant and effective. It is to cut waste, cut the red tape and let business get on with business, thus creating the conditions for more job growth and opportunity. The Gene Technology Amendment Bill 2015 will make amendments to the Gene Technology Act 2000 to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the Gene Technology Regulatory Scheme. The amendments will not make any significant changes to the framework or policy settings of the Act. In line with the government's deregulation agenda, the amendments will decrease regulatory burden for regulated organisations and help to ensure that regulatory burden remains commensurate with risk into the future. <coughs> Pardon me. This bill in, is part of the response to an independent review of the Gene Technology Act 2000 conducted for the Legislative and Governance Forum on Gene Technology. Gene technology is the term given to a range of activities concerned with understanding gene expression taking advantage of natural genetic variation, modifying genes and transferring genes to new hosts. We use gene technology in crop and animal research to improve the sustainability and productivity of agriculture and to protect plants, animals and humans from disease. Today, only a small proportion of research funding and investment related to gene technology also comes from the private sector. Involving companies and industry is important to get commercial uptake of new products and ensure the intended benefits are realised. <coughs> Private investment is important and we need more of it. Hence, this gene technology bill must be viewed as part of a holistic strategy, where all parts of the legislative program work to a common end. This bill is about making Australia a better place to conduct and invest in research. Indeed, it is impossible to mention research in this place without drawing attention to our government's announcements of a first world first 20 billion medical research future fund. This is truly a world beater and world first that demonstrates that Australia and the Abbott government are serious about science. The benefits of genetics to vaccine production are manifold, manifest and real. <clears throat> Vaccines produced by genetic engineering offer an advantage that the microbial strains from which the proteins are extracted do not contain complete viruses, and thus there are no risks of an accidental inoculation with live virus. Cloning directly into vaccinated virus DNA holds great promise, although vaccines so produced are not yet on the market. Recombinant 
vaccinia viruses, for example, a gene from uh, genital herpes virus within its DNA, can multiply and can subsequently be inoculated into humans. The vaccinia virus produces mild infection and expresses some of the herpes virus protein and produces immunity. This is very similar in a way to what Edward Jenner did centuries ago when he introduced the first vaccination scheme which he le eventually led to the extinction of smallpox. Vaccines can be produced using decombinant, recombinant DNA technology or using cell, cell culture. Vaccines of common use are usually produced by cell cultures or animals. Such vaccines <coughs> contain weakened or inactivated pathogens. Crop plants can bear cheaper bioreactors to produce antigens to be utilised as edible vaccines. These edible vaccines are said to be a cheap alternative as compared to recombinant vaccines. The transgenic plants are treated as edible vaccines and consumption of these transgenic plants uh, via, for instance, transgenic banana or, uh, or tomato cure diseases like cholera and hepatitis B. Foot and mouth diseases can be cured by feeding them transgenic sugar beet. In the near future, these vaccines can be used as conventional vaccines. Humulin was the first therapeutic product to be made commercially by genetically engineered bacteria. Recently, a genetically engineered malarial vaccine, SPF 66, has been produced. <coughs> Genetic engineering promises to have an enormous impact on the improvement of crop species. Genetic transformation can boost plant breeding efforts for developing disease-resistant varieties. Australians bring unique strengths to the scientific table. Our lateral thinking and novel ideas allow us to solve worldwide problems. In particular, Australians are great team players. It is our scientific teams that form the engine rooms which fuel our major discoveries, from astrophysics to biochemistry. This is a really exciting time in genome and epigenome research. The cost of sequencing a human genome is over 1,000 cheap, times cheaper than it was just a few years ago. One can now sequence one's entire genome for just $1,000. In the coming years, this genomics revolution will become much more apparent to us as it brings transformative advances in agriculture and medicine. It, this will touch everyone and have major economic benefits, and so it's the perfect opportunity for Australia to play a leading international role in the area of genomics. Being serious about science means having a long-term vision and a workable, affordable, costed plan. We must, as a nation, invest in the cheap end of the innovation pipeline, invest in the cheap end of the health equation. This means putting further money into research and preventative medicine. Concomitant, concomitantly, the same is true for our climate challenges. Australia must invest more in energy research and remove the artificial barriers and legislative restrictions. As we move up the value chain, the increase in labour costs makes red tape and compliance costs even more expensive. Hence why this bill that seeks to reduce the red tape requirement is so important. As an aside, this bill provides an opportunity to comment on the face of Parliament. Today there are too few scientists in this place. Such is the dearth that Labor members reading this bill may take gene technology as being the name for a denim department in their local mall. As a polity, we must decide how we view and value science as scientists. We must also ask the question in earnest, what type of members do we want in Parliament? The trend may be for a new breed of professional politician, but what we know from genetics is that diversity in the gene pool gives you long-term success. So too it must be the case in the Australian Parliament. 
Australia must compete in the global economy by creating high value added goods and services. Science is exactly the industry where we can excel and have done so many times in the past. CSIRO is a beacon institution that points the way for Australia as a world beater. Now, in terms of gene technology and the benefits that accrue, I have a very personal story to tell here. I had two second cousins that both had cystic fibrosis. And for anyone that has come across people that have got cystic fibrosis, it is a terrible disease. I mean, I re remember my second cousins struggling for breath. I mean, they lived comparatively old ages for cystic fibrosis sufferers. One lived to his uh, mid-30s and one to his early 40s. But that is way too short and the quality of life is way too low. Now, genetic engineering gives you the potential to solve some of those problems by, for instance, having a genetically modified virus that you uh, either ingest, as I've mentioned previously, through eating or otherwise through something like a nasal spray, which can then modify the genetic st structure within the lungs to prevent the problems that you have with cystic fibrosis. And there are numerous other diseases that similarly have debilitating effects where it is enormously expensive medically to treat. I mean, cystic fibrosis is hugely expensive, and uh, particularly when you need to have ver uh, transplants of lungs, potential, or even heart and lung transplants and so on. Enormously expensive, and how exciting would it be for us to be able to give a cure to a young child who is desperately struggling for breath? I will finish by quoting Carl Sagan. He once said, every kid starts out as a natural born scientist and then we beat it out of them. A few trickle through the system with their wonder and enthusiasm for science intact. Clear and simple laws allow for hard but fruitful research.